Hello. Uh, okay, I'm currently working on the Panoramics project, which is an EU-funded project to research and develop mixed networks. Um, and we're going to talk about traffic analysis and traffic analysis resistance. What does this mean? Some people liken it to anonymity, like Tor gives you these anonymity properties. Um, but actually, a lot of times we talk about this, we mean location hiding properties. Um, and in particular, Tor is not enough for a lot of threat models. Um, why isn't Tor enough? Uh, so for one thing, Tor's, uh, Tor's network, the interaction of Tor users extend beyond the Tor network, right? They have these exit nodes, and they can't actually control the whole protocol all the way to these websites you're visiting through Tor. Uh, so you can't send decoy traffic to websites, just in case you're maybe pretending not to look at them. Um, so how can we keep message, messaging data we can keep private if we make a closed system? a thing that doesn't exit to the rest of the internet. Um, and mixed nets are what we're going to talk about. So in 1981, David Chom invented this mixed net concept. Instead of having this one hop proxy, it's, it's easy for a sufficiently global adversary to uh, completely de-anonymize communications through one hop proxies or even through the Tor network if they can see both sides of the connection. Uh, but imagine, if you will, um, we have this, uh, this threshold mix, which has a threshold of four messages. So it accumulates four input messages. And once it ha hits its threshold, it outputs the messages. Um, so since the messages are I all indistinguishable, you have a one in four chance of, of saying that one particular message here is the same one as one of the particular input messages. So here we're using, we're not just using crypto. Crypto is not enough. Uh, traffic analysis can completely, uh, uh, can tell a lot of metadata about a, a cryptographic protocol session. And so what we're here doing is we're using crypto, but we're also using statistics to try to hide uh, metadata about some interaction, to, to hide to whom is speaking to whom, uh, when they send a message, uh, how many messages they send, how big their messages are, if they're even sending a message at all, or are they sending decoy traffic. So this implies layered encryption because we're not going to obviously have a single mix. Um, if the single mix operator becomes a bad actor, or if they're a bad person to begin with, or if they get a national security letter, uh, they can be corrupted by, by the state actors, for instance. So how does this give us different properties than the previous slide with one mix? If we have two mixes, we only need one of the mixes to be honest. Um, and then we still get these, these traffic analysis resistant properties, this, this ability to hide the metadata. You see one message go in, and you're, you're like, oh, there's a 25% 20, uh, chance that one of those messages is the message I saw go in. Um, obviously, like that's not very good odds. We want to increase the threshold to like 10,000, but um, four is a good, easy number to work with for these slides for the purpose of trying to develop an intuition about how this works. Um, we're not going to get super hardcore into math, but um, I think we can we can understand it uh, on an intuitive level. Um, so mixed networks don't quite look like this because clients need to learn about the network. Um, we're using source routing. So all of the layers of encryption are created by on the client side, uh, which means the client needs to learn about the public keys on the network. And so to do that, we use a PKI system. The Tor network uh, has, can have a similar sort of uh, diagram to this in, in the sense that they also use PKI. Um, so yeah, David Chom invented this stuff in 1981. Mixed networks are actually the oldest anonymity system, and it was the inspiration for Tor, not the other way around. Um, and briefly, what is a mixed network? It's a message-oriented system. It's essentially an unreliable packet-switching network. It has all the layers of encryption in a single packet, and there is added latency for each hop. And the added latency increases a passive adversary's uncertainty about whether or not a message 
um, exiting the mix is the one that they saw earlier enter the mix. There could be multiple, it's kind of like, if we're, if we're having a dinner party and we're sitting around and I suggest to all my guests that they write some secret letter in an envelope and everybody has identical envelopes, we can put them into a backpack and mix them and I can pull envelopes out. And even though you saw these envelopes go in and you saw some envelopes come out of this backpack, you still don't know which ones I'm pulling out until it's opened and revealed. And so similarly, MixNets provide that property. Um, there's, I'm gonna be talking about some attacks and defenses. Uh, there's a lot of point-to-point -point literature um, about different networks that use gossip protocols and partial views of the network. And there's a lot of literature that says that if, you have a, if you're a client and you have a partial view of the network, you're really exposed to attacks. Um, and that's some, uh, and we can, t if people wanna talk to me after the talk about this stuff, then I can go into more detail. Um, this is what it called a cascade mix. It means everyone uses the same route through the network. Uh, the mixing bowl and spoon there with the circly arrow, that's supposed to be a mix. So those are three mixes in, in a series. And unlike Tor, uh, MixNets don't need route unpredictability to achieve their security properties. This means that everyone can use the exact same route and you still have excellent uh, metadata, traffic analysis resistant properties. You can call it anonymity uh, if that suits you. Um, why don't we use free route? Um, free route is rather intractable, difficult to, commu to compute the en entropy on each mix, the amount of uncertainty that an attacker would have on each mix. But this scales really well compared to this. Um, and so we have a kind of trade-off. Uh, we have the stratified mix topology, which is um, it gives us the ability to scale. We can add mixes to any of the layers, and each layer can communicate with the next layer only. Uh, so it's, it's more restricted than the free route topology, uh, but it still allows you to scale and also to, to uh, easily compute the entropy on each mix. Um, okay, so mix networks, isn't this kind of the same as Tor? Isn't this the exact same thing? No, it's not, actually. Uh, so mixes add latency, and the latency that they add to each hop as, a pack, as your signal is traversing the network, these, uh, this can be a trade-off, a functional trade-off between entropy and latency. Um, so there's different mix strategies that are used to create uncertainty for passive attackers, and um, so the one I mentioned earlier is called the threshold mix, and it's the simplest example to give in a talk like this, but there's many others that we use. There's dozens of MixNet designs. They've been around for over 36 years, so of course there's lots of work in academia, and we want to see more work, uh, more sort of collaboration with industry partners who uh, actually need this stuff. Um, okay, so uh, to briefly describe the first attack, uh, say if you already know the mix is empty as an attacker, if it's not empty, you can send your own messages into it until it hits the threshold. Then the mix sends its messages onto the next hop. Once you see your target message enter the mix, uh, you can, the attacker sends his own messages into that mix until the threshold is hit. And then when the messages are output, um, the attacker recognizes his own messages and the one message left over is the target message he was trying to trace. So this is called an N-1 attack or a blending attack. There's many variations for these attacks depending on the mix strategy used and other design. Uh, and this, this attack would be repeated over and over for each hop in the route. Uh, you can completely break mix nets with this. Uh, it's pretty devastating, but you can also defend against it um, by having a heartbeat protocol. Uh, so each mix in the network can send itself a message, kind of like a self-addressed stamped envelope. It goes through, through the mail system, or you know, in this case, through the mix network, and returns back to the sender. Uh, so a heartbeat timer would then um, indicate, if, if it doesn't receive its message in a certain timeout period, then um, it knows that it's under attack. Uh, um, there's other mix strategies like continuous time mixes where each message has some delay uh, determined by the client for each hop. And so an N minus one for this type of mix, uh, the attacker would basically cause a denial of service attack and prevent all messages from entering the mix until the mix queue is empty 
and then allow the target message to enter and then wait for it to exit and, and follow its path through the network. Um, so we also have statistical disclosure attacks. If people come and tell you that mixed nets aren't vulnerable to global passive adversaries, but Tor is, that's actually wrong. Uh, it, it, it actually, it, the answer is it depends. Uh, and it, the reason it depends is because user behavior can be repetitive and predictable. If users behave in a predictable manner, it, at least predictable to an adversary, then an adversary can make a, a abstraction. The whole mixed network is one mix. They, the attacker watches the input messages and the output messages. And so if, if we're doing decoy traffic and you go offline and I see fewer messages go to certain recipients, then that's leaking some information. So understanding the rate of this information leakage versus how dynamic user behavior is, is very important for understanding uh, how, uh, how secure mixed nets are against global adversaries. So um, the Lupix uh, is a recent paper published in Usenix 2017, and it's about mixed network design. And um, instead of send, so a lot of the mixed net papers are written in the context of point-to-point -point networks as if people have publicly routable IP addresses. You can't actually send people messages these days, right? Because we have NAT devices that get in the way. Um, so instead, we want to queue the recipient messages on some server somewhere. So it could traverse, use the mixed network for its location hiding properties or anonymity properties. But in the end, you're going to need to queue messages on a server. And that actually creates, it makes, it forces passive adversaries to then become active adversaries. They have to hack some server to see which queue a message is uh, landing in. So um, we have decoy traffic. The reason we have decoy traffic is so that adversaries won't know, won't be able to distinguish uh, when you're sending a message and when you're not sending a message. Uh, it also adds uh, some noise into a signal that an, a passive adversary may be watching the mixed network. And um, so we have three different types of decoy traffic in Lupix. Uh, client loops, actually, as I just described in this slide, so if the attacker has compromised the server where clients are, have their mailboxes, um, we, can, we can add noise to that, right? Clients can send themselves messages through the mixed network, and then when that message comes back, it's indistinguishable from a real message they're receiving. So this means that even if the adversary has compromised servers where messages are being queued, um, we can still add noise to that signal by using this decoy traffic. Let's see. Um, when clients receive messages from their provider, they can say, hey, do you have any messages for me? And every time the provider should send the same amount of information back. This is not decoy messaging, but it's a kind of traffic padding uh, scheme. And lastly, we need reliability. Um, if you don't have reliability in your messaging system, it'd be like, hey, bro, like, yeah, message me later. Uh, I might not get it because our system is unreliable. Um, so we actually have added a stop and wait ARQ. It's an automatic repeat request protocol scheme. It's kind of, uh, TCP is an example of this. Uh, the only way to achieve uh, reliability end-to-end uh, -end is for clients to retransmit the data if they don't get an acknowledgement packet back saying, we received it. So we have this working over a mixed net where you can, mixed nets are unreliable and we can make reliable protocols on top of them. Um, I think this is what users need. There, there was a sort of uh, popularity contest that MixNets lost about 10 years ago, and Tor sort of became the dominant uh, anonymity network. And part of that is because MixNets were really slow, and also they were unreliable. Um, and we, we're changing that now. Um, we also have some amount of defense in depth. Uh, so uh, we have link layer encryption, as well as a mix uh, packet uh, encryption layer, and we also have end-to-end -end messaging uh, inside that. Um, so this is an example of sort of an architectural diagram of, of like a Lupix style mixed network. Here Alice is sending a message to Bob, and there's, uh, there's not strong location hiding properties, but from a third-party observer, a third-party observer shouldn't be able to tell that Alice and Bob are communicating. So that's, that's kind of the goal with Lupix. 
Um, there's decoy traffic involved, there's other users. So if, if, imagine if there's a lot of traffic on this network and there's decoy traffic, it would be really hard for an adversary to tell who is talking to who. Um, so this is the kind of thing that I'm really interested in, uh, as opposed to like Twitter and social media and exposing your social graph to the public. We can actually hide all of that, hide who you're friends with, who you're communicating with, even when you send them a message. Um, but uh, a lot of the security analysis for these systems are sort of online security analysis. As long as you stay online, uh, you get these properties. Um, they tend to leak information when you go offline. Uh, so we, we, try to, we try to make uh, um, the situation dynamic enough to change so that adversaries can't do these long-term statistical disclosure attacks. Like over time, they can gather leaked statistical information so uh, uh, yeah, Bob later retrieves his message. Uh, we can build, we can, with very little code change, we can build stronger location hiding properties where we uh, don't collect our message from the same machine over and over again so that one provider doesn't uh, collect a bunch of information about you. Um, and we can collect our information from other points on the network. And mixnets are uh, pretty good at this uh, sender and receiver anonymity uh, properties, but we, we need to use them correctly. Um, in the past, uh, there's been a bunch of failed mixed network uh, um, projects in the past. And uh, so I, I'm thinking about this Zcash use case, right? Uh, it, your, your anonymity properties of your blockchain system or, or whatever it happens to be, in this case, if it's Zcash, it, you really need to actually hide your interaction with that blockchain from a network adversary. It's not just about uh, people looking at the blockchain for collecting data about you. It's about network adversaries. So I think that for a closed messaging system that doesn't have any exit nodes where we control the entire protocol in the network and we employ um, decoy traffic properly, we can actually, uh, within certain constraints, um, protect uh, this kind of interaction with the Zcash blockchain from a global adversary. Um, not that that's necessarily the goal. I mean, sufficiently global adversary who's not m even passive, ac an active adversary. Um, so I think that this case, this use case is tolerant of latency. Um, obviously, every sort of scheme like this should have reliability, but we don't need explicit protocol acts in this. We can just check the blockchain to see if our transaction is there uh, sometime later after submitting it through the mixed network. Um, we, can, we can do without provider authentication if you want. If you want to leave a gaping hole for the internet to denial of service attack your system, that's fine. Or we can have authentication. Uh, so our, like, our designing mixed networks is very flexible. We can meet lots of different use cases. Um, and uh, if the minimal mixed network uh, which we may or may not want to actually build, but the minimal mix network for this uh, submitting of blockchain transactions only really needs two types of decoy traffic. Um, we don't need client loops because we're not receiving messages. Users aren't receiving messages. They're not forming uh, communication partnerships with other users, so there's less exposure to statistical disclosure attacks. And um, so here's an example of like a minimal uh, mixed network where there's no authentication. Alice just sends her transaction through the mixed network. It lands on some provider, which then submits it to the blockchain. And, um, but do we want to do that? We could actually combine uh, like a Lupix style messaging system, like Cats and Post, with Zcash, so that we have a anonymity set of people messaging each other, like instant messaging apps and things like that and combine that, uh, that entropy, that noise in the system with, uh, with transaction submissions to the blockchain. Uh, but we would have to make these messages indistinguishable from each other. And so in the, in the Lupix system, uh, that's about, uh, these are modeled as Poisson processes. And there's this cool property of Poisson processes where if you can, you can aggregate these different types of traffic that are sent at different rates, and their aggregation just looks like another Poisson process. And this, this allows us to, to uh, combine different types of traffic together and uh, allow them to be indistinguishable. Um, all right, that's the end of my talk. Uh, these are the people I work with. 
um, and I've learned a lot from them, and it's been really great. If anyone has any questions, um, now would be a good time. Or you can talk to me afterwards. Uh, yeah. Hi, thank you for that interesting talk. Uh, and thank you for explaining everything. Uh, is there any reason why you can't just take something like I2P and run all the traffic? use that as a transport layer? What's the reasoning why you want to do something special for stack cache? So, uh, no, ITP is great and Tor is great and we should all use them. Uh, I, I'm not saying anything uh, like against these other projects. I'm merely pointing out that if you want to protect your metadata, your traffic analysis from uh, very powerful adversaries, uh, in my opinion, mixed nets are the only game in town. There are DC nets, they are PIR systems, they don't scale. Mixed nets scale to millions of users and are, can, can defend against very powerful adversaries. Uh, they, are the, they are the inspiration for things like Tor and I2P. Uh, Strad. Hey, uh, great talk, thanks. Um, on the point about Poisson distributions, um, you obviously, in, in your consideration, they are mixing two distributions, you know, Cats and Post and Zcash, for instance. Yeah. Is there a limit to how many you could mix? Like, say your network has um, chat, um, chat messages, um, website download messages, Zcash publishing chains, um, some kind of file sharing or BitTorrent style thing. Um, if you were able to reasonably model the distributions of each of those individual things, is there a limit to how many you could actually multiplex over the network? Uh, I, I don't think there's an inherent limit, but there, there's a cost, there's an overhead cost. So this slide, this shows loops, drops, and, and forward packets, uh, each as a Poisson process. And, and we can add more to that, but um, one of the interesting differences between cats and post and like say blockchain transaction submissions are that cats and post you're forming you're forming communication partnerships with people uh, and we have an ACK packet that bounces back from the provider right to acknowledge it so we actually have to emulate that for the decoy traffic for the Zcash traffic so that it looks indistinguishable from this messaging traffic um, so there's more overhead, right? More bandwidth, network resources. Um, yeah, I don't think there's a limit, though. Uh, but this is not, this is not, uh, we, I mean, there, further research required. Um, yeah. OK. Um, any other questions? OK. Well, thank you. Thanks.